Hello everybody, this is Jörg once again from YouTube channel Joggler66, Hour of the Truth, with another reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. I continue today in chapter 11, that is called Pagan Origin of Papal, of oh, Pagan Origin of Papal Office. And I'm on page 50, uh, 75 in the PDF, if you read along. Nimrod, the king and founder of Babylon, was not only its political leader, he was its religious leader also. This is just as the Pope today, who calls himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the title belonging to our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not the Pope, and not Nimrod, but he also as you can see, he was a religious leader and a political leader. Don't we have separation of state and church? How about when the leader of the country claims to be also your spiritual leader? Then you don't have separation of church and state. Then you have the Roman, the Babylonian system all over again. He was a priest king, the author continues. From him descended a line of priest kings, each standing as the head of the occult Babylonian mystery religion. This line continued on down to the days of Belshazzar, of whom we read in the Bible. Many are familiar with the feast Belshazzar in Babylon, when the mysterious handwriting appeared on the wall. Mene Mene Tegel Ufarsin, it said. The numberer is numbered. Some have failed to recognize, however, that this gathering was more than a mere social party. It was a religious gathering, a celebration of the Babylonian mysteries of which Belshazzar was the head at that time. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and praised the gods of silver and of brass, and of iron, of wood, and of stone, as we can read in Daniel 5. So I'm going to read a little from Daniel 5, so that we understand what this entails. I start in verse 22. Quote, And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, Though thou knowest all, thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath, thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and his writing was written. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tegel, Ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tegel, Thou art weight in the balances, and art found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Adding to the blasphemy of the occasion, they drank their wine from the holy vessels of the Lord, which had been taken from the Jerusalem temple. This attempt to mix that which was holy with that which was heathenism, or profane, brought about divine judgment. Babylon was marked for doom. The prophets had told how the city would be destroyed. So we read in Jeremiah, 50. 
the word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. This whole chapter is every it's, it's very interesting to read. But I will not go there now. That would take too long. But read for yourselves what the results were of the abominations the king did to God. But in 51 verse 62 we read, Then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate for ever. End quote. Today there is a railroad which runs from Baghdad to Basra, which passes close to the old site. A sign written in English and Arabic says, Babylon, halt! Train stops here to pick up passengers. The passengers are tourists who come to inspect the ruins. But though the city was destroyed, concepts that were a part of the old Babylon religion survived. When Rome conquered the world, the SUN sun worship that had spread from Babylon and developed in various nations was merged into the religious system of sun worshipping Rome. This included the idea of a supreme pontiff with the title Pontifex Maximus, an office that began to be held by the Caesars in 48 BC. This is illustrated here by an old Roman coin of Augustus Caesar from 27, through 14, from 27 BC through 14 AD, with his title as Pont Max, the head of the mysteries. Coins such as this were in circulation during the days of, the Lord, of our Lord's earthly ministry. Quote, and they brought unto him a penny, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's, as we can read in Matthew 17 through 22. So I'm going to give you the whole quote from the King James Bible. Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? Or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto him, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled, and left him, and went their way. I know that this is a passage in the Bible often, of course, misquoted, but I can tell you one thing. God said, The world is mine, and the fullness thereof. God made it all. When the world is his, and the fullness thereof, answer to me, what then is Caesar's? Now, the Roman emperors, including Constantine, continues the author, continued to hold the office of Pontifex Maximus until 376 AD, when Gratian, for Christian reasons, refused it. Uh, Christian reasons, I don't think so. But maybe some reasons, he refused it. He recognized this title and office as idolatrous and blasphemous. Well, he was absolutely right in that. By this time, however, the Bishop of Rome had risen to political power and prestige. Consequently, in 378 AD, just two years later, Demasus, Bishop of Rome, was elected the Pontifex Maximus, the High Priest of the Mysteries. Since Rome was considered the most important city in the world, some of the Christians looked to the Bishop of Rome as Bishop of Bishops and Head of the Church. And this same man was claiming the title Pontifex Maximus, a unique arrangement. By this time, and through the years that followed, the streams of sun worship, uh, S-U-N uh, worship and Christianity flowed together, producing what is known as the Roman Catholic Church under the headship of the Pontifex Maximus, the Pope. I'm going to read this again. 
because this is what I absolutely every time I think in this readings and other readings state that the Roman Empire hid himself hid itself under the garments under a veil of Christianity they baptized themselves with Christianity that they took their olden pagan rituals statues idols and just gave them Christian names and that is the Church of Jesus our Lord Catholics think about where you come from when you do not know your roots you do not understand your belief system and here it is clearly stated in this one little sentence quote by this time and through the years that followed the streams of SUN Sun worship and Christianity flowed together producing what is known as the Roman Catholic Church under the headship of the Pontifex Maximus the Pope The title Pontifex Maximus is repeatedly found on inscriptions throughout the Vatican, above the entry of St. Peter's, above the, above the statue of St. Peter, in the dome, over the Holy Year door, which is opened only during a Jubilee year. Now, so now, in 2016, you can go through that door, since Pope Francis opened all these kinds of doors for the Jubilee year we are experiencing right now and I'm going to repeat my opinion on this Jubilee year this is the last ultimatum to the Protestants to come back under the wings of Rome or else hmm. so even over the Holy Year door, which is opened only during a Jubilee year, etc., we just read. The accompanying medal, struck by Pope Leo X just before the Reformation, illustrates one of the ways that the title Pont Max has been used by the popes. But how could a man be at one and the same time both the head of the Church and the Pontifex Maximus, the head of the SUN worship mysteries. In an attempt to cover this discrepancy, church leaders thought, sought for similarities between the two religions. And they always find something, they think. They knew if they could find even a few points that each side had in common, both would be merged into one. For by this time, we're not concerned about details. Most were not concerned about details. They desired numbers and political power. Truth was secondary. Truth is secondary today. Truth is only what you have in your perception. And your perception is led when you live in this world by the Roman Catholic Church and their teaching, whether you know it and acknowledge it, or whether you don't. You don't have to be a Catholic churchgoer to be Catholic. You just have to be raised in this Roman Catholic system, which, with the school system, with the universities, and everything else, and all the governments, as you can read and understand when you get the book Rulers of Evil, or followed my listening I did on the videos there. Truth was secondary. Truth is secondary today. Nobody wants to know the truth because it is so comfortable to live a lie. The author continues, One striking similarity was that the supreme pontiff of SUN worshippers before the Chaldean title Peter or interpreter, the interpreter of the mysteries. Here was an opportunity to Christianized the SUN worship office of Pontifex Maximus, the office the Bishop of Rome now held by associating the Peter, or Grand Interpreter of Rome, with Peter the Apostle. But this was not without its problems. To do so, it was necessary to teach that Peter had been in Rome. Thus, tales about Peter being the first Bishop of Rome, unknown and unheard of in earlier times, began to be voiced. And so, writes Hislop in his book 
the two Babylons, which I'm reading in German right now on my channel, to the blinded Christians of the apostasy, the Pope was the representative of Peter the Apostle, while to the initiated sun worshippers, S-U-N, sun worshippers, he was only the representative of Peter, the interpreter of their well-known mysteries. And I have to add here something, because when you follow my reading on rulers of evil, you will understand that the Hebrew word pronounced Peter means firstborn, and when the Roman Catholic Church states that they are the successor of Peter, which is the English word for Peter in Hebrew, which means firstborn, they are correct by saying that they take their name from Peter, but they do not mean the Peter of the Bible. They are speaking of Cain the firstborn of Eve. And there is even a prayer that I have been looking up. I don't find it anymore on my computer. I read it in one of my shows on Hour of the Truth, where I think it was Pope Paul VI in the time of Vatican Council II in the 60s of last century, that he even says that they bear the mark of Cain. Cain was the firstborn of Adam and Eve. In the Hebrew, that means Peter. And this Peter is the basis for the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they use mental reservation. They will never tell you that. Instead of that, they just tell you a lie and say Peter was in Rome. Now, was Peter in Rome? Let's have a look at the book. Since the Apostle Peter was known as Simon Peter, it is interesting to note that Rome not only had a Peter, an interpreter of the mysteries, but also a religious leader named Simon, who went there in the first century. This Simon, known to Bible students as Simon the Sorcerer, as we can read in Acts um, 8 verse 9, quote, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and be bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one." Unquote. So this Simon, known to Bible students as Simon the Sorcerer, is said to have later gone to Rome and founded a counterfeit Christian religion there. Where? A counterfeit Christian religion. What's Roman Catholicism? Because this sounds so bizarre, in order to make it clear there is no bias on our part, we quote the following right from the Catholic Encyclopedia about this Simon. This is what the Vatican writes in their own Catholic Encyclopedia. Listen closely. Justin Martyr and other early writers inform us that he afterwards went to Rome, worked miracles there by the power of demons, and received divine honors both in Rome and in his own country. Though much extravagant legend afterwards gathered around the name of this Simon, it seems nevertheless probable that there must be some foundation in fact for the account given by Justin and accepted by Eusebius. The historical Simon Magus, no doubt, founded some sort of religion as a counterfeit of Christianity in which he claimed to play a part analogous to that of Christ. Unquote. There it comes, out of their own mouth. We know that the Roman Catholic Church became expert in taking various ideas or traditions and mixing them together into its system of religion. If Simon did build up a following in Rome, if he received divine honors, if he founded a counterfeit Christian religion in which he played a part analogous to Christ, is it not possible that such ideas could have influenced later traditions? Perhaps this Simon, being in Rome, was later confused with Simon Peter. Well, 
Perhaps this Simon, being in Rome, was later deliberately confused with Simon Peter. The popes have claimed to be Christ in office on earth. Apparently Simon the sorcerer made the same claim in Rome. But we never read of any such claim made uh, of any such claim being made by Simon Peter the Apostle. Another mixture that Rome involved keys. For almost a thousand years the people of Rome had believed in the mystic keys of the SUN worship god Janus and the goddess Cybele. In Mithraism, one of the main branches of the mysteries that came to Rome, the SUN sun god carried two keys. When the emperor claimed to be the successor of the gods and supreme pontiff of the mysteries, the keys came to be symbols of his authority. Later, when the Bishop of Rome became the Pontifex Maximus in about 378, you know, after the rejection of uh, this other Pope two years before, he automatically became the professor on the mystic keys. The possessor, sorry. <laughs> what am I reading here? He automatically became the possessor of the mystic keys. This gained recognition for him from the SUN sun worshippers, and again, there was the opportunity to mix Peter into the story. Had not Christ said to Peter, quote, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, as in Matthew 16, verse 19 we can read. It was not until 431, however, that the Pope publicly made the claim that the keys he possessed were the keys of authority given to the Apostle Peter. This was over 50 years after the Pope had become the Pontifex Maximus, the papal possessor of the keys. Keys are shown as symbols of the papal authority. To make a little comment on this here. The silver key, which is laying beneath the golden key, resembles temporal or civil power on the earth. The golden key, which is on top and is superior to the silver key, represents the spiritual power. So the civil power always is an obedience to the spiritual power. Now do you understand why it is so important to recognize the Roman Catholic Church as a civil power hiding under the spiritual? As I read in the beginning already. Martin Luther recognized this too in his letter to the German nobility from 1520. I'm going to give you the quote. The Romanists, with great adroitness, have built three walls about them, behind which they have hitherto defended themselves in such wise that no one has been able to reform them. And this has been the cause of terrible corruption throughout all Christendom. First, when pressed by the temporal power, they have made decrees and said, that the temporal power has no jurisdiction over them, but, on the other hand, that the spiritual is above the temporal power. Unquote. If you want to read more, I made a video of that paper in Hour of the Truth, and here's the link that I will also put in the description box, where you can read that for yourselves. And of course you can also look up my video on Hour of the Truth. It's about this letter to the, uh, to the uh, German nobility that's in the title of Hour of the Jews. You can find that easily in my videos. The key given to Peter and all the disciples represented the gospel message whereby people could enter the kingdom of God. Because some have not rightly understood this, it is not uncommon for Peter to be pictured as the gatekeeper of heaven, deciding who, will let, who he will let in and who he won't. This is very much like the ideas that were associated with the SUN sun worship god Janus, for he was the keeper of the doors and gates in Roman mythology. Janus, with key in hand, is shown in the accompanying drawing that I will put in the video right here. He was represented with two faces, one young, the other old. A later version of Nimrod incarnated in Tammuz, as we know, when we understand Babylon mystery religion. It is interesting to notice that not only was the key a symbol of Janus, the cock was also regarded as being sacred to him. 
There was no problem to link the cock with Peter, for had not a cock crowed on the night that he denied the Lord, as we can read in John 18, verse 27. It is certain that the title Supreme Pontiff or Pontifex Maximus, which the Pope bears, is not a Christian designation, for it was the title used by Roman emperors before the Christian era, as I read before, 48 BC it started. The word Pontiff comes from the word Pons, bridge, and Fascio, make. It means bridge maker. The word Pontifex Maximus means supreme bridge builder. The priest king emperors of the SUN worship days were regarded as the makers and guardians of the bridges of Rome. Each of them served as high priest and claimed to be the, bride, the bridge or connecting link between this life and the next. Again, little quote, the title Pontifex Maximus was handed down from the Medo-Persian Empire to Rome. But because the Romans did not deify their emperor, Julius Caesar in 48 BC was the first emperor to be lifted up as deity, and therefore receiving the titles as the first emperor of pagan Rome. On the bottom of page 79, the author continues, That branch of the mysteries, known as Mithraism, grew in Rome until it became, at one time, almost the only faith of the empire. The head priest was called Piet Pater Patrum, that is, the father of fathers. Borrowing directly from this title at the head of the Roman Catholic Church is the Papa, or Pope, the father of fathers. The father of Mithraism had his seat at Rome then, and the father of Catholicism has his there now. So what are the roots of Roman Catholicism? Mithraism. And call no one your father, for there is one father who is in heaven. This expensive and highly decorated garments that the popes wear were patterned after those of the Roman emperors. The historians have not let this fact go unnoticed, for indeed their testimony is that, quote, the vestments of the clergy were legacies from S.U.N. sun-worshipping Rome, unquote. The tiara crown that the popes wear though decorated in different ways at different times, is identical, identical in shape to that worn by the quote-unquote gods or angels that are shown on ancient S.U.N. sun-worship Assyrian tablets. And remember, Assyria is equal to Babylon, according to Alexander Hislop, where most of the knowledge of this book is taken from. It is similar to that scene on Dagon, the fish god pictured here, that I will put in the video. Dagon was actually but a mystery form of the false Babylonian savior. The name Dagon came from Dag, a word commonly translated fish in the Bible, and means fish god. Though it originated in the S.U.N. sun worship of Babylon, Dagon worship became especially popular among the Philistines, as we can read for confirmation in Judges 16 verses 21 through 30, and in the first book of Samuel chapter 5 verses 5 and 6. The way Dagon was depicted on Mesopotamian sculpture is seen in the drawing reproduced above, so I will show that in the video here. And isn't it interesting in this regard that the evolution theory claims all life came out of the sea, like fishes crawling on the earth to make it their dominion? Fish God gets a new perspective then, doesn't it, when you follow the wrong teaching of evolution theory? In his book Babylon and Nineveh, Layard explains that, quote, the head of the fish formed a mitre above that of the man, while its scaly, fan-like tail fell as a cloak behind, leaving the human limbs and feet exposed, unquote. 
Later in the development of things, just the top portion remained as a mitre, with the jaws of the fish slightly opened. On several Maltese coins, a god, whose characteristics are the same as those of Osiris, the Egyptian Nimrod, is shown with the fish body removed, and only the fish head, mitre, is remaining. A famous painting by Moretto shows St. Ambrose wearing a mitre shaped like the head of a fish. The same type of mitre is worn by the Pope as seen on the sketch of Pope Paul VI as he delivered a sermon on peace during his historic visit to the United States in 1965. During or just after Vatican Council II that gave to the Americans the wonderful present of the Charismatics and the Ecumenical Movement, which turned even probably the last Protestant over to the Roman Catholic Church, as it is today. Because when you call yourself a Protestant, what are you protesting if not that the Pope is the Antichrist, the Biblical, Historical and Prophetic Antichrist, Go back to your Protestant roots, America. Go back to the Bible. The one true and only word God preserved today, the 1611 King James Bible. And see who the Antichrist is. He, the guy with the mitre, sitting on a golden throne in Rome, and even coming last year, 2015, speaking in front of a joint session of the Congress, in the United States of America capital, which is a temple of Jupiter. They knew when they built the capital that they would build it for the Pope once to come in there, right? Because it's his temple. It's Jupiter's temple, a capital. That's not me saying it. That's something you can find out very easily doing your own research. What I hope you will do next to this reading here. H. A. Ironside, continues the author, says that the Pope is, quote, the direct successor of the High Priest of the Babylonian Mysteries and the servant of the fish god Dagon, for whom he wears, like his idolatrous predecessors, the fisherman's ring, unquote. Again, in mixing S-U-N, sun worship, and Christianity together, similarities made the mixture less obvious. In this case, since Peter had been a fisherman, the fish guard ring with the title Pontifex Maximus inscribed on it was associated with him. But a ring like this was never worn by Peter the Apostle. No one ever bowed and kissed his ring. He probably didn't even have one, for, as he said to the lame man, silver and gold have I none, as we can read in Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Another clue to help us solve the mystery of Babylon modern may be seen in the use of the pallium which the Pope wears over his shoulders. The unabridged dictionaries define it as a garment that was worn by the S.U.N. sun worship clergy of Greece and Rome before the Christian era. In modern times, the pallium is made of white wool, which is taken from two lambs which have been blessed in the Basilica of St. Agnes in Rome. As a symbol that the Archbishop also share in the plentitude of the papal office, the Pope sends the pallium to them. Before it is sent, however, it is laid all night on the supposed tomb of St. Peter, such being a copy of S.U.N. sun worship that was practiced among the Greeks. Over the centuries, the Roman Catholic Church has claimed to, to possess the chair in which Peter sat and ministered at Rome. But this would be a strange chair for Peter. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia once again explains that the plates on the front of the chair show fabulous animals of mythology as well as the fabled labors of Hercules. 
In another volume of Catholic Encyclopedia, we find these words, quote, Gilgamesh, whom mythology transformed into a Babylonian Hercules, would then be the person designated by the biblical Nimrod. Unquote. It is curious that Nimrod is likened to Hercules and carvings associated with Hercules appear on the so-called Chair of Peter. None of these things would cause us to think of this chair as being of Christian, real, true, Bible-believing Christian origin. A scientific commission appointed by Pope Paul in July 1968 reported that no part of the chair is old enough to date from the days of Peter. Carbon dating and other tests indicated that the chair is no older than the 9th century. Clearly, the earlier ideas about Peter's chair were interesting, but not accurate. People, you don't have to dig deep to expose the Roman Catholic lie. Just dig a little, and all the evidence is there. And then, when you read the evidence, and examine the evidence, and prove it against the Bible, you have two choices. Whether you say, Oh! I've been living like this all my life. What does it matter? I don't care. Or, you can face the truth and change your life and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior as it is written by God the Father in the Bible. Make Jesus your only mediator between you and your Father who is in heaven. The man Christ Jesus is the only mediator, not the Virgin Mary, who was not a virgin after giving birth to Christ because Christ had brothers and sisters later on but the Mary adoration of the Roman Catholic Church is idolatry of the Queen of Heaven who has his roots well anybody? where? let's say together on three one, two, three Babylon, Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven. I continue in the book. Near the high altar of St. Peter's is a large bronze statue of so-called Peter. Some old writers have argued that this was originally a statue of Jupiter, renamed as Peter. And I have to add here, that is right. I often told my listeners and the viewers of my videos that this statue was taken from the Pantheon in Rome and placed in St. Peter's Basilica as Peter. They just baptized the figure with another name. Baptized between quotation marks, of course. Such was the opinion of the Emperor Leo, who published an edict in 628 against the use of statues in worship. Nevertheless, this statue is looked upon with the most profound veneration, and its foot has been kissed so many times that the toes are nearly worn away. The practice of kissing an idol or statue was borrowed from S.U.N. sun worship. As we have seen, Baal worship was linked with the ancient worship of Nimrod in deified form as the Sun sun god. In the days of Elijah, multitudes had bowed to Baal and kissed him. Yet, God said, I have left my seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Unquote, as we can read in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. In one of his mystery forms, Nimrod, incarnated in the young Tammuz, was represented as a calf. Statues of calves were made, worshipped and kissed. Just remember you, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, and he came back with the tablets the first time, 
they worshipped the calf that they made. Quote, they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say unto them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves, Unquote. as we can read in Hosea 13, 1 through 3. I will give you the original quote right now. When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more, and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, Let the men that sacrifice the calves. Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud, and as the early dew that passes away as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. Unquote. Kissing an idol was a part of Baal worship. So, kissing the feet of St. Peter, part of Baal worship. Kissing the ring of the Pope, Baal worship. Not Christianity. Not only was the practice of kissing an idol adopted by the Roman Catholic Church, so was the custom of religious processions in which idols were carried. Such processions are a common part of Roman Catholic practice, yet these did not originate with Christianity. In the 15th century BC, an image of the Babylonian goddess Ishtar was carried with great pomp and ceremony from Babylon to Egypt. Idol processions were practiced in Greece, Egypt, Ethiopia, Mexico and many other countries in olden times. The Bible shows the folly of those who think good can come from idols. Idols so powerless, they must be carried. What does the Bible say? They have eyes and see not, they have ears and hear not, they have hands and handle not, they have feet but walk not, they have mouth but speak not. Sound familiar? The Bible shows the folly of those who think good can come from idols. Idols so powerless they must be carried. Isaiah, in direct reference to the gods of Babylon, had this to say, as we can read in Isaiah 46 and verses 5 through 9, quote, To whom will ye like me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver in the balance, and hire a goldsmith, and he maketh it a god. They fall down, yea, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder, they carry him, and set him in his place, and he standeth. From his place shall he not remove. Yea, one shall cry unto him, yet can he not answer, nor give him out of his trouble. Save him out of his trouble, sorry. Remember this, and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Unquote. Not only have such processions continued in the Roman Catholic Church <coughs> in which statues are carried, but the Pope is also carried in procession. In Isaiah's time the people lavished silver and gold on their God. Today, expensive garments and jewels are placed on the Pope. When the S.U.N. sun worship god was carried in procession, the people fell down and worshipped, so on certain occasions do people bow before the Pope, as he is carried by. Even as the god was carried upon the shoulder, so do men carry the Pope, the god of Catholicism, upon their shoulders in religious procession. 
over 3,000 years ago. And by the way, I will put <coughs> a picture here from Pope Pius XII, who was carried in the Sedia with the flabella of feathers in the video, so that you can see this abomination. Over 3,000 years ago, the very same practice was known in Egypt, such processions being a part of SUN sun worship there. The illustration below, so the picture in the video now, <coughs> shows the ancient priest king of Egypt being carried through worshipful crowds by twelve men. A comparison of the papal procession and the ancient SUN sun worship procession shows that one is a copy of the other. In the drawing of the Egyptian priest king we notice the use of the flabella, a large fan made of feathers, later known as the mystic fan of Bacchus. These fans are also carried with the Pope on state occasions as showed in the picture that I showed you in the video here. So compare the picture of Pope Pius and the ancient sun worship procession. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, quote, When going to solemn ceremonies, the Pope is carried on the sedia, a portable chair of red velvet with a high back and escorted by two flabella of feathers. Unquote. That these processional fans originated in the SUN sun worship of Egypt is known and admitted by Catholic writers. Admitted by Catholic writers. You don't even have to listen to Protestant readings like mine. <laughs> you can read it from their own sources. Just read it. Study it. Rome is Babylon. Babylon is Rome. And the Pontifex Maximus claims to be God on earth. The four strong iron rings in the legs of the chair of Peter were intended for carrying poles. But we can be certain that the Apostle Peter was never carried through crowds of people bowing to him. Why? Because we can read in the wonderful word of God, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, quote, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Unquote. That the papal office was produced by a mixture of sun worship <coughs> and Christianity, there can be no doubt. The pallium the fish at mitre, the Babylonish garments, the mystic keys, the title Pontifex Maximus, all were borrowed from SUN sun worship. All of these things and the fact that Christ never instituted the office of Pope in his church plainly show that the Pope is neither the vicar of Christ nor the successor of the Apostle Peter. I think this was made quite clear right now. For the viewers of this video who are able to understand German, I advise you to switch over also to my German reading of Von Babylon nach Rome, which is the German translation of the book The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, which is on the basis on what Rev. Woodrow wrote in this book. So if you really want to go deep into the study, read that. And otherwise, well, just take out a Catholic encyclopedia and study a little bit of the history that you Catholic think that you Catholics think is real Christianity. And in the end you will find out that even Rome itself says so. But of course, in some written books, in some written encyclopedias, in bulls and encyclicals that you never read because you only listen to a man you don't read anymore. What if tomorrow every Catholic in the world would receive a 1611 King James Bible and the commandment 
to read. What would happen? I think we would see a revival of biblical Christianity as never ever before. But because the Roman Catholic Church works so wonderful in this temporal power and controls all the governments and all the education and all the media, something that you can find out when you read the papers Miranda Prosus and Intermirifica, that the Church has a birthright on all movies, radio, television, printing press. The church has a birthright on there. Since we live in that system, we don't see it if we aren't asking questions. And it is absolutely disencouraged in this world to ask questions, to ask or to question authority. When you do that, you are a terrorist. Or in Germany, you are a Nazi. Because that's very comfortable. Eh? Just call the people Nazis and then they shut up. It works. People shut up. People stop thinking for themselves and stop doing investigations and research for themselves. Only when you have a curious mind you will finally come to the truth and not being misled by men. I know that I am a man and teaching this by reading this book here. I know. But I'm just giving advice. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe this, this author. But do your own research. And the further you do your own research in the right direction, based on your consciousness, based on the Bible, you will see that this is the truth. And only the truth you find out for yourself is the truth that you should really accept as truth. The word of God is truth. God never lies. He is incapable of lying. As Satan is incapable of telling the truth. So your choice is, do you rather believe a lie you've heard a thousand times than the truth you have once? If the truth makes sense to you, continue in it. If the lie makes sense to you, well, continue in it. You have to find out for yourself. I can only assure you one thing. When you try to free your mind from all the indoctrination you've had through all the years in your life and open the King James Bible and read it from start to finish, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And the fear mongers of the Roman Catholic Church and their Jesuitical institutions don't have a hold on you anymore. Christians are not afraid because they know who their Lord is and they know what death is and they know what comes afterwards. That gives us a reinsurance that we can live a life so free, the Roman Catholic Church and Satan are only tracking us down because they cannot live with the freedom of the mind. And the mind of the Christian is set free because he believes and lives in the Word of God, the true God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. and Jesus Christ, His Son and our Savior. So I encourage everyone to do their own research. 
and come to their own conclusions. Here and there you can grab a hand that is stretched out to help you, like I do with mine, and I hope you take it. But in the end, you will only be convinced of things that you find out for yourself. Only you have to learn not to listen to man's teachings, because otherwise you go and buy all these pagan and stupid books out there, and you will be led from one dead-end street unto the next. But when you find the Bible, when you find the true Word of God, you're on the highway to heaven, instead of a highway to hell. So, thank you very much for listening, and I will continue next time in chapter 12, which is called Papal Immorality. I can tell you right now it is a very interesting one. So, I hope you enjoyed this one, and please, as I said, I refer to my other readings and other studies. Please do this, and I hope to see you again next time with chapter 12, Papal Immorality from Babylon, Mystery Religion. Until then, Jogla 6066 signing off, Hour of the Truth signing off, wishing you a nice day, and God bless you and keep you in all his ways. Keep on studying the Bible. Until next time, God bless you and bye-bye.